How do you transform a cavernous cold church into a futuristic house? Or turn dilapidated old barns into stylish family homes? From industrial workshops to ancient windmills, this series follows brave homeowners. The original wall has come away from the chapel. As they take on seemingly impossible challenges. That isn't going to happen until next year, never mind three weeks' time. Absolutely barreling down. Of transforming historic structures never built to be lived in. We explore the ancient master crafts an ingenious modern design it takes to build an impossible house. It's another bit of history saved. In this episode, a determined homeowner. Before, you wonder whether it was going to happen. Looking forward to it now. And an anxious builder. That's why I'm scared. That's why I'm nervous. Battle challenging spaces. This project's all about being round. Thinking outside the box, but inside the circle. Gonna, so it should, imperial fit. <laughs> we see. And brittle brickwork. We're scared in case it all collapses. To transform this historic farm building. It's all about the history, retaining knowledge and a bit of respect. Into the ultimate dream home. I always said I'd like a new house. <laughs> I've got it, did not I? Kent, the mild climate and fertile landscape here have helped generations of farmers cultivate thriving crops. One of Kent's most famous harvests is hops, used to make beer. During the 19th century, more than 70,000 acres of farmland here were used to grow hops, with local brewers producing up to 800 million gallons of beer a year. Once harvested, the hops were dried and processed in special agricultural buildings called oast houses. Thousands of these structures are dotted across the Kent countryside, with their distinctive white pointed cowls standing out against the lush green landscape. Modern beer production techniques have rendered these old buildings obsolete, but today many are being transformed to enjoy a new lease of life. These agricultural industrial structures are slowly being turned into homes. It sounds idyllic, but their conversions come with some very real challenges. <laughs> 79-year-old Hazel Harwood has been living on this farmstead in Kent since 1962. Hazel, along with husband Cedric, had three children here and ran the cattle farm for 55 years. We had dairy cattle, then we gave them up and had beef cattle. My husband used to do the milking, and I used to go out bottling the milk up there, night and morning. When Cedric passed away in 2015, Hazel and her beloved dog Lucy were the only ones left living in their four-bedroom family farmhouse. Oh, diggle, 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 diggle. She has to have her tummy rubbed every morning when I come down. Today, the farmhouse is proving too big for just the two of them. Hazel has made the brave decision to sell it and move into a smaller house. But she's not moving too far because she has bold plans to transform the farm's historic oast house just 50 steps away into her new dream home. My younger son said, why don't you convert that oast and sell this? The oast house has been a part of the farm since 1872. It was originally built to dry hops. The roundels had kilns burning at their base, a floor in the middle where the hops were placed to dry, and a conical roof with a pointed cowl on top to create a good draw for the fire below. Once dry, the hops move to the cooling barn and then down to the ground floor to be packaged for shipment to the brewery. In a good season, one roundel could process over 15 tonnes of hops. 
Hazel's Oast House was never designed to be lived in and has been neglected for years. Turning it into a home won't be easy. With a budget of £270,000, Hazel is working with family friend Glyn Charlton to help her project manage this enormous challenge. Uh, Hazel relies on me to make sure that it's all going favourably and, and she, I think she just likes a bit of moral support. Ready? Talking to the builder when we were discussing the job, he said this lady knows what she wants and she wants what she knows. She wants to go and live somewhere comfortable for the rest of her life and she's making the decisions here all the way through. Hazel has been using the Oast House as a garage and storage for farm equipment. Its traditional cone-shaped roof had to be removed 50 years ago. It would be nice because my husband, he took them oaths off years and years okay. ago because it was a bit dangerous. I think it's going to take about six to eight months to yes. build it from the start. Yes. Hazel's vision is to radically transform the oast house. She wants to gut the cooling barn to create a raised ground floor kitchen, dining, living area. Above it, she'll put another floor to house a bedroom and office. The West Roundel will have a staircase to the upper floor, while the East Roundel will become a lounge with a spare bedroom above. And finally, Hazel wants to put the coned roofs and cowls back onto the roundels to restore the original shape of the building. Work begins in the winter by wrapping the dilapidated Oast House in scaffolding and protective plastic sheeting. Out to here to the bathroom, 2.8. In charge of turning Hazel's dream into a reality is Director of Construction, Stu Benjamin. None of this is structural here, is it? Peckham-born builder Stu sees this as the job of a lifetime. It's been my goal forever, turning something that's over 100 years back to its original state, and to get the opportunity to do it is fantastic. Look where we are. Can't get much better than this. <laughs> Here's going to be a utility room. We've got to put square cabinets, square washing machine into a randall, which is really fantastic. We love these challenges. Stu's first real challenge is to stabilise this dilapidated building. This won't be easy. First, Stu must raise new concrete block walls inside the barn and then assemble an internal skeleton of steel and structural timber that connect to the old wood frame. In the roundels, they must install two steel beams to support a floor. Timber joists will run from these into pockets in the original wall. They must do the same for the second floor. The wood and steel skeletons will tie the new and old structures together and prevent the Oast House from collapsing. We're literally building a building with inside a building. These here are the ex existing structure, so they're holding the two outer frames together. We can't take these off right until the end because what will happen is we're scared in case it all collapses. So all this wall, which is original, is tied with that wall. If I do that, you can see that it's giving us a little bit of stability, hence why we're a bit concerned about taking these off. But we're leaving that right in. That's where I'm scared. That's where I'm nervous. The 147-year-old brickwork is crumbling like cheese. It makes Stu's challenge of building a new house inside the old structure even tougher. We've cut out for the new doorway. If you can see, that brick's completely blown. So that brick will have to come out, but as we build the brickwork up, we'll take that out and redo it, just to give us our structure and our strength. And this is where our staircase comes. You'll walk around here, and then you'll walk up, and walk up to the next floor. The winter weather makes the task of shoring up the exterior brickwork even more difficult. The brick layers I pulled off today because it started raining all day. British weather, I love it because we're all waiting for the roof to go on, because it means everyone's inside, we ain't got to worry about the weather. 
Please, Weather, love me. It will be an epic battle for Stu and the team to transform this challenging structure. It's taken three months to stabilise the old structure's crumbling walls and seal the building from the elements. At the start of this project, the building hardly resembled an oast house at all. But after months of hard work, it's time to start rebuilding, resurrecting that most iconic part of any oast house, the roof. Around the edge of the roundel brickwork, Stuart's team must first cast a bed of sand and cement. On top of that, they'll put a wooden ring called a wall plate. To this, they attach four wooden rafters, which they connect with cross braces, and a wooden ring on top to give them strength. Then they add more rafters to make a cone-like shape and tie them together with wooden braces before covering the cones with felt and roof tiles. It rests on the shoulders of Darren Hole to erect the Titanic roof. So your insulation will come to there yeah. and it will come out because you've got an inch here. Right. Darren runs a highly specialised 80-year-old family business that's dedicated to rebuilding and restoring the intricate roofs of oast houses. We try and keep it as original as possible. And that is pretty much the same as it was 100 years ago. It's crucial that the wall plate sits perfectly level so that the tall cone-shaped roof doesn't lean. But the old brickwork makes this a challenge. If this plate wasn't level, it would show massively on the top that all the rafters that we pre-cut, they wouldn't fit. It looks simple and we think it's simple, but I suppose it isn't. <laughs> we make it look easy, but it's just because we've done it so many times before, it just works. There, yeah? Yeah, right there. Stu's keen to pick up the pace and complete the roof before spring showers arrive. By the end of the next week, I'm hoping the oast will be watertight and this roof will be watertight. If we achieve that, I'm happy. If we don't, they're sapped. I'm sorry. <laughs> Today, there are only two traditional oast houses still working in Kent, and the hop season's harvesting is in full swing. The oasts here at Little Scotney Farm were built in 1871 and produce Scotney Ale. Their inner workings offer a unique insight into how Hazel's distinctive shaped roof would have been used when the building was originally operational. Once the hops have been stripped from their vines, the team here begins the drying process. A working roundel is where the hops are brought to dry. Each roundel can dry almost half a tonne of hops at one time. Hot rising air dries the hops as it's drawn up through the cowl on the top. Once the hops are dry enough, they're dragged out into the cooling barn. The hops are now dry and crispy, ready to be added to beer, giving it the unique, traditional, hoppy flavour. In a good season, this 30-acre farm can produce over 60 tonnes of hops. In 1878, hop farming reached its peak. 77,000 acres of the land in Kent was used to farm this crop. That's almost 154,000 tonnes of hops. This is the process that would have gone on in Hazel's Oast House for 100 years. Hazel's 75-acre farm played a small part in this great British hop boom. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free, no subscription required. It's 
It's taken two weeks of back-breaking work for Stu and Darren to erect the entire timber roof structure on Hazel's Oast House. Since Christmas, it's got on a lot. It's better now. Now you can see what's going on. Before, you wonder whether it was going to happen. Looking forward to it now. The next challenge is to seal the roof. To cover both roundels and the barn, the team are using traditional handmade Kent peg tiles. The guys are using a Tudor tile. They're called a Tudor mix. We wanted to make sure that the oast and the barn was all as one. As you can see, all the felts on, they're battening out. They've been here for one day and this is the progress they're making. What it means is we can start taking off the lid. We're in the dry. Fitting the rectangular tiles onto the cone-shaped roof isn't easy. With the tiles, we use squares and tapers. So that way, when it comes round, if the tile starts going downhill like that, the table will swing it back round. And then every, every fifth row of so sand and cement each tile so that holds them all tight so they won't come off when it's a windy day. Tiling the exterior of the conical roof takes great skill and craftsmanship. The task of transforming the interior of this unusually shaped space into a practical living area calls for an equal amount of expertise and imagination. Today, oast houses are among many complex-shaped historic structures that are being turned into extraordinary abodes. In 1820, there were up to 10,000 windmills dotted across the UK. Today, only 400 remain. Some have been given a new lease of life by being transformed into homes. In the Suffolk countryside, the circular form of this 19th century windmill proved a huge challenge for its owners, Natalie and Steve Roberts, to reconfigure into practical living space. Probably the main headache really was the fact that the building was round and just everything had to be made to bespoke to fit the fact that the building is round. There's pretty much nothing in here that's bought off the shelf and if it is we've had to adapt it to fit to the space. Natalie and Steve created a practical living space here by building bespoke furniture, curved worktops and bedroom headboards that hug the round walls. A curved staircase fits the contours of the interior and leads up to a striking zinc-clad timber pod. The inside almost looks like the hull of a boat. And I believe in the past, people who used to make the actual domes to the windmills actually used to be boat builders. The living space at the top is actually a surprisingly large space. It's very tall, a very, very cosy space. Innovative design and materials have helped breathe new life into this iconic piece of industrial heritage. Hopefully, when we're not here in another 100 years, it will still be here, albeit in a different guise from what it was like when it was originally built. In Kent, it's taken four weeks for Stu and Darren to complete the roof on Hazel's Oast House. But a last minute request, a new window, means they have to undo some of their handiwork. If I'm being honest, I'd rather they said that now. Last thing I wanted to do was plasterboard all this, plaster it, and then have to do it. That's what happens, that's, that's building. Yeah, what's that say? Oh, bye -bye. Well, but, but... John's facial windows are a little bit smaller, but I didn't think we'd get it in there, if I'm brutally honest. I didn't think you'd get that size window in the day. Yeah, the job done. Yeah, that's in. Inside, Stu has devised an intricate plan to leave a smooth finish on the inside of the circular roundels. We put a 9mm plasterboard to get us off going, and then we put a 6mm plasterboard. That's more flexible and you get the bend just to keep it all round, so it keeps that symmetrical circle as much as possible. The heads as well, by the doors and around the windows, are really difficult because the windows are square. 
and you're putting them into a round, so we've had to taper our plasterboard into the reveals. The cone-shaped rooms upstairs are proving a bigger headache. We cannot put a full sheet of plasterboard on here and hope that we get that round. So every bit of plasterboard will be cut to the middle of each joist, coming all the way down. I am so worried about this. This is like a horrendous job. While Stuart worries about the inside of the cone, the outside also needs work. It will soon need topping out with its defining feature, its white pointed cowls. From the 1700s right through to the 1900s, thousands of oast houses were built across Great Britain. There was a whole industry dedicated to their construction and maintenance. And if you search hard enough, you can still find remnants of that vibrant artisan community. The first invoice of our company was 1937. Every single one is finished by hand and built by hand. The original job of a cow was to keep out the rain and draw up hot air from the kilns to dry the hops. Each cow rests on a long wooden pole, which lets it rotate through 360 degrees. Its clever angled shape means that when the wind blows, the cowl always has its back to the breeze to make sure an oast house can work in all weather. Its simple yet effective design works well to this day, just the way Darren likes it. Every single one of these, they're a different size, but they're all bespoke, everything is different. First thing, it's got to weather, and then secondly, it's got to do the job, you know, and it's got to look right. There is a bit of artist license in it, a little bit in there. We're just setting out the basis of the cow, which is the bottom curve. Darren prides himself on making every cow in the traditional way. We could move it on, we could, we could mill things out with a router, but do you know what, why? Darren builds and restores around 200 cows every year. Each historic cow has its own tale to tell. Sometimes we get these in and it might be 50 years old. We know it's 50 years old, because when we start to sand the paint off, we know it's, there's a green layer. So back in World War II, the Luftwaffe were using the white spots as they were flying over as reference points to plot their way to drop the bombs. And that's where they painted them out green up there so they couldn't use them as a plotting point. And so it's history. I try and save as much of the original as we can. Darren's family kept cows turning throughout the Battle of Britain. In this workshop, even the toolbox is an ancient artefact. This is why I've got so much respect for the ancestors. And I've got a saw like that, which is a sliding miter saw, but everything that we can do, they would do with these. This would have been used by somebody in my family hundreds of years ago. So imagine like, I'm pulling out a tape here that one of my ancestors would have looked and he would have gone, right, I'm going to measure that cross and I'm going to measure the top of that keel. And this is the tape that he would have used. It's just like, oh, it does my head in. I love it. It's all about the history and it's all about retaining knowledge and a bit of respect. The business is now four generations strong with Darren's 24-year-old son, Brandon, next in line to pass the knowledge on. Brandon's the fourth generation. I'm the third. Then there's Dave, Spider, as we call him. He taught me. And then his father-in-law taught him, Martha. There's a god. Yeah, it's pretty cool, mate. Pretty good. I love my job. While Darren and Brandon prepare the cows for Hazel's Oast House, 
Stu and his team are gearing up to plaster its challenging mix of square and round rooms. Everything's got to be square, bud. Yeah, everything. They make quick progress in the barn. But the roundels prove a struggle. The curved and conical contours are a plaster boarding nightmare. As it comes up like that, it's going to be smaller at the top, so you have to cut the board at an angle. That makes it awkward. There's a lot of measuring and cutting, so it's going to be slow process. But we're experts. <laughs> Following years of neglect, Hazel's Oast House is structurally stable and its roof turrets have been resurrected for the first time in half a century. After five months, the structure is looking more like its original mid-19th century self again. Today, the team reaches a landmark moment. Darren is back on site to install the cowls. Well, so basically this goes in the bottom of the post. So that, and then we'll fit this into the top of the roof and these, these work together. When we fit the cow, this is fitted in the top of the roof and then it'll be full of grease and then before we fit every cow, we always put the queen's head in there. And the coin of the realm that goes in there and then the cow will come down with the pin in the bottom, locate in there with all the grease and it will turn on that. It's really simple, not complicated, no bearings, nothing to go wrong, nothing to seize up and it says it would have been 100 years ago. Darren has constructed the roof in the traditional way, but with one essential addition, a watertight cap. Originally, this wouldn't have been here. It would have been open, so the air would have come up through the kiln, drawn up through the cow, through the cow, and, and the front will suck the air out from inside and pull all those flames up and get it all burning and get it drying, and it's perfect. But, but now, obviously, this is a house and they don't want loads of water flooding into the roof. The cow will work to a certain extent, but like when we have a, a false nine, it's blowing a hoolie and the cow's running about and the water's flying everywhere, this is what that's for. The fingers of the cow will ensure it still turns as they would have centuries ago. Darren has even added a personal touch for Hazel. Hazel, she loves dogs, um, so we put a dog on one finger. I think it's very similar to the, the dog that she's got now, so that, that'll work. And then the other motif is um, a cow. And obviously, this used to be a cattle farm, so I'm guessing this is a little hark back to the history of the farm. So something new and something old, so it works. With everything in place, it's now time to carefully crane the expertly crafted cowls onto the top of the roundels. A cow can weigh up to 220 kilograms, and these need to be lifted 20 meters in the air. Today, the weather may be against them. Windy up there today. It's an anxious moment for Hazel. A strong gust could blow the cow into the scaffold, so they must be on guard. This one comes up. We put it between the two. So I got. I just guide him in. You just get hold of it. You got it? One cow craned up, one to go. Left. Hold it there. That's it, stop. Now down. We're on. You like that? What a change from day one. Mate. <laughs> I've been waiting for them to go on. That'll work, won't it? You <laughs> have to try. Isn't it? That's it. Go on. Put it in. That's a bit harder. With both cows in place, they can slot in the fingers. And you can take that out of the back, right? Right, in that. Straighten the arm. That's the icing on the cake. It's absolutely perfect. It's back how it was 120 years ago. It's great, isn't it? It's lovely. I say it'd be nice when the scaffolding's down, you'll be able to see more of it.
back in the day when they were picking ops. The family would go picking ops, and every time they picked a bushel, they'd go to see the tally man, and he'd pull out his tally stick for that family, and he'd put a notch on it. And so at the end of the week, you go and see the tally man, you know, you've got six notches, six bushels, and then you get paid. So we use this as like a service book. So I'll put on there the date today, two cows, just put a signature on there. It's better than having a piece of paper sitting in the drawer that will get lost. It's been a great job. It's another bit of history saved. Hazel and Glyn hoped it would only take six months to transform the Oast House. After five months, the exterior is looking good. The roof is sealed, the exterior brickwork restored. The team's final challenge is to turn the unusual shaped interior spaces into functional rooms. This project's all about being round. Everything's round. You're in a round room, keep everything round. And that's the main goal. Thinking outside the box, but inside the circle. With the interior space divided up and walls smoothly plastered, Stu's next task is to install the timber fittings. We've put all the skirting on now, and we've done all the window boards like this in the roundels. So we've kept the curvature, it's all rounded off. One of Stu's biggest challenges is to fit a square staircase to these round walls. His plan is to build it in many straight sections. Stu must connect each section to the curved wall, as well as a centre post that bears the weight. They must fit together perfectly and hug the walls precisely, so the straight edges blend seamlessly to the contours of the roundel. So this is my staircase. Each section of the staircase has been cut to size in a dream. workshop off-site. I'm like a kid with sweets. <laughs> the big question, will it fit? Yeah, I've had a thing with the host houses. It was never designed to have a staircase in in the first place. So, so there lies the problem with these round walls. So it should, in theory, all fit. <laughs> We see. Beautiful. Yeah, that's in. I'll give it a little bit of a wiggle. Yeah. Oh. Uh, beautiful. Oh, oh, and you've just missed my window board. Mate, it could not have been <laughs> any tight. So you knew that, Steve? I knew the window was there, yeah. Probably not quite as tight as that. <laughs> <laughs> It's good to be like living in the area and, and actually working on some of these old buildings. It's nice to see them coming back to life. With the staircase in, the team races to complete the finishing touches. It's always like this at the end of a job. Go, go, go. Because you want, obviously, the hinges to be hidden, don't you? And then yes. And cladding to carry on. Did they cladding just to carry on? Yeah. When all the pressure's on, you just reflect and think, do you know what? This, this is the job, this is the project. It makes it all worthwhile. Look, this Garden of England. This is Henry VIII's country. I've got my, my beautiful queen. I've got Lord Nelson. And I've got I am, I am, my Henry VIII. I'm not interested in the politics, I'm just your everyday builder. But I do believe in my history, so this is why I'm so glad and privileged to be out here to do this. It's a dream. That's the main goal, get the job right, then enjoy it. At the old farmhouse, 79-year-old Hazel is gearing up for her first house move in 57 years. We've already packed a few things up, you know, different bits and pieces, photographs, ornaments, getting it all ship shaped. Years ago, my husband used to say that would make a nice house, the host, and it's come true. After a four-week push, Stu has finally completed work on the Oast House. It's now ready for Hazel and her beloved dog, Lucy. It's a good girl, because you're going down there to live, aren't you? When I stand here and look at that, I'm so happy. What an achievement. Beautiful. 
Today, Stu is handing the keys back to Hazel. Morning, Hazel. Morning, Stuart. How are you doing? Um, all right, thank you. Nervous? Yes and no. Hazel has sold the old farmhouse to a young family, meaning the move to the Oast House is imminent. Well, how do you feel about leaving a big part of your life, this house? I've got to move on. Somebody else is coming in here. They've got children and I hope they'll be happy. Ah, oh, quality. So you've yeah. got no... No. No regrets? No. You're looking forward to the yes. change? Yes, yes. Cool, you're brave. Yeah. My wife hates change. Well, I hope this will be the first one. Oh, was it? Yeah, since I was married, so we just see how it goes. Stu and his team have spent over seven months working to bring Hazel's Oast House back to life. It's finally time to say goodbye. Hazel. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. Just cuddle. Yeah. yeah. All right. So you've got your new house now? Yes. Thank you very much for all your boys and what you've done. Eight months after the build began, Hazel has left the old farmhouse and moved into the completed Oast House. The Oast House has been fully restored to its former glory. The black traditional timber barn and the two circular cone forms are once again interlocked. The curved surfaces and brick details support the clay-tiled conical roof. With Darren's cows sitting pretty on the top. It has undergone a truly remarkable transformation by mixing intensive labour and fine craftsmanship, this old farm workhorse has been reconfigured into a comfy house. But after living in the old farmhouse for over half a century, is Hazel calling the Oast House home? You soon settle in. I never did like it in the, over there. So when I come here, it feels like home. The inside of this historic structure has undergone an extraordinary transformation. This end is the kitchen. There's lice and light. Downstairs, the open plan kitchen dining area leads into the two circular rooms. The east roundel is Hazel's new living room. This is the front room. It just looks nice in here. I can still look out the windows and have a nose and see what's going on. And the West Roundel houses her utility room. I've got the washing machine, tumble dryer, and my freezer in here. Stu's expertly crafted staircase fits seamlessly to the curved walls of the West Roundel and leads up to the first floor landing. This is the half round or what was like downstairs. The east round all has been transformed into a comfy bedroom. This is the other host and it's been made into a bedroom and there's the cowls go up there, right up the top there. The old cooling barn now houses Hazel's bathroom and bedroom. This is the bathroom. In the shower room, it's a wet room, actually. They've made a good job of it, you must admit. This is my room. You can look out the windows and see all the sheep and the cows out in the fields. As long as we can have a nose out, that's the main thing. <laughs> Very happy with it all. It was worth waiting for. 
Hazel's historic Oast House has undergone a miraculous change. The once derelict Hop House is now well and truly a home. Family friend and project manager Glyn Charlton had hoped to have completed the build in six months. We had done some extra things on the way, like building the decking, and, and there were one or two other jobs which we added to the, the original project. So having come out of it at eight months, we were quite happy. The original budget was £270,000, but having secured the sale of the farmhouse, Hazel decided to upgrade areas of the Oast. Choosing underfloor heating, higher quality fittings and a stove that cost £10,000. Ensuring her new home is comfortable and luxurious for a cost of £290,000. And we also future-proofed the house because with Hazel getting older, we wanted to make sure if she wanted to live downstairs, she could. So the lounge can become a bedroom and there is a shower and bathroom downstairs. And the extras don't stop there. We decided to add the garage and some decking, and we ended up at around the 325,000 mark. Working together with the builders and the guy doing the plans, we, we thought we'd got something that Hazel would like. Thank goodness we did. Yes! <laughs> After 57 years in the farmhouse, Hazel is embracing the move to next door. It looks nice here with the plants out. Over there I had plants, but they never looked so well as these. When the project first started, this structure was barely recognisable as an oast house at all. The wonderful conical roofs had been cut off and it was in a terrible condition. Now it is rejuvenated, reborn. You thought, ah, am I doing the right thing? I think it was something you just got over and then afterward you see it coming along and think, oh, that's right, be glad when I get in there. I've had no qualms at all. Feels like home now. Hazel's incredible attitude to take this project on when she was 79 and move in when she was 80 says a lot about her character. It also means she's managed to stay on the farm she loves. That's the cherry on the cake or the cow on the oast house. <laughs>